Welcome to Archaeology Books for Fun, where we talk about books about archaeology that are accessible to anybody. This is episode two, part two of the book, The Dig, by John Preston. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> um, and so we did the first half of this book on our previous episode. Barbara, can you give us a quick recap of what we talked about last time? Sure. So The Dig is about an archaeological site that does really exist in England called Sutton Hoo. And it's about not just what they discovered, which was really significant, and you're just going to have to listen to part one if you want to know all the details. But it was a lot, it, it had to do a lot with the uh, people that were involved in the excavation too. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of politics involved, a lot of power plays. And this was taking place, or the book takes place, right as World War II is breaking out. So that's something to keep in mind as well, um, which was putting a little bit of pressure on the excavation because they wanted to get it done before you know they went to war. But we stop. So the book is broken into uh, chapters that are from the viewpoint of specific characters in the book. And we ended with uh, Basil Brown, who was an amateur archaeologist or avocational archaeologist whose father was a geologist, so he had a lot of knowledge about the soils and about the site, and he had worked on excavations before. And the book ends, like I said, there's a lot of power plays, where he just loses control of the excavation. He was brought in originally by the landowner to do this excavation, and then a museum comes in and kind of starts taking charge, and that's where we left off. Yep. And just a reminder, too, uh, this is historical fiction, right? So there's plenty of stuff that's filled in for make it more readable and fun to read. And uh, some of the stuff is just plain made up, which I know Barbara has a couple notes on later on. Yes, I do. So we start off this, uh, this chapter and we switch to a new perspective this time. This time we're at the perspective of Peggy Piggott, who is a archaeologist, uh, seems like she's recently graduated, based on what the, the text says, um, and she is on her honeymoon with her new her husband, Stuart, and um, both of them have degrees in archaeology, which is a thing that archaeologists do sometimes. Some archaeologists might suggest it's not a good idea, but... Uh, what, marrying another archaeologist? Yes, uh, but... Many of them, people do make that work. So, you know, hey, I, I got a sense uh, based on the interactions that uh, Stuart is perhaps a little more established than Peggy or perhaps it's just kind of a pater paternal. Yes. And I believe they actually met at university. Uh -huh. And I'm trying to remember what their relationship was at the university. But I want to say, yes, he was more established. She's just graduated, and I just love the fact that their honeymoon is ends up being an archaeological excavation because I feel right. like that would really happen in real life. Right, because they get a yeah, a, absolutely would, wouldn't it? Especially, like, I mean, talking. I mean, I know it happened in real life, but I I can just see like a modern archaeology couple being like, oh, let's go excavate for this our honeymoon. site is cool. We're going to do that instead. Yeah, yeah. So they get a telegram from Phillips, who we talked about last time asking them to come out, specifically asking for Peggy to come out, and we don't understand why until just a little bit later, but they decide to leave their honeymoon plans, leave their hotel that was um, kind of decrepit and subpar anyway, and like, yeah, let's go do this instead. Um, and it was it's kind of funny because I like the interaction there because he clearly wanted to go, and she clearly wanted to go, but they're both kind of like, yeah, they were like, oh, my gosh. How does the other person feel about this? And yeah, and I think it's funny because I think if you've ever been in a relationship, that's happened where you both want to do the same thing, but you don't know if the other person wants to do the same thing. So right. you have to approach it carefully. So I, I thought that was a really good portrayal of that interaction. And it just kind of brought the characters to life to me because you see that they're both very enthusiastic about archaeology and about this site. 
but they're also like, oh my gosh, we're on our honeymoon. I don't want to ruin our honeymoon, but oh, there's this really cool site. And I just, I thought it was a very cute interaction. Yeah. Yeah. I liked it too. So they, they leave and go to stay at the site. Um, they're actually staying in a hotel, which as we talked about uh, before, we in our cultural resource management days, Barbara and I both did plenty of that because you go to a site and if you're lucky, you're in a hotel. If you're not lucky, then could be camping, could be who knows. <laughs> Oh, yes. And it wasn't always the greatest hotel. You know, yep, you're in no. these little areas that are being developed, right? We're out there before development occurs. So there's usually or oftentimes not, you know, a nice hotel. It's a little hole in the wall. Right. Roach infested. <laughs> or, or worse. Yeah. yeah. No, there's there are plenty of stories which we won't get into here. Maybe someday in the future. But Peggy impressed all the guys by drinking beer, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, and then, so Philip sits down with them and starts to lay out the sides of the detail, which is the first time we get some of this detail. Um, he says the the ship is 80 to 100 feet long, although I think he says they haven't quite finished excavating the whole thing. And he is guessing 6 to 800 AD. He mentions how... Uh, it was found by Basil, and again, we, we won't be too surprised by this, but Phillips is quite derisive of Basil. And again, as we talked about in the last episode, he's not necessarily wrong in his criticism of Basil's methods, but he's a real jerk about it, and he does not endear himself very well. Well, and as you read the book, you really get to like Basil. He's a very likable right. character. So right. he's very sympathetic. Yeah. yeah. And seeing how others treat him automatically clouds your judgment of those people as right. well. To be know? to be a little bit fair to Phillips as well, he's kind of derisive of anybody who isn't in lockstep with him anyway. So it's not that he's just picking on Basil, but he's just kind of unnecessarily um Well, and there's also that whole um, white tower mentality for you know, or tower, ivory or tower, tower mentality yeah. where you know he works at a museum he's a trained archaeologist and he comes in and this amateur is excavating this mm -hmm. site so he just kind of throws his weight around a little bit which there's a history of that in yeah. archaeology the majority of sites are found by non-archaeologists and um, they either report it to, you know, the appropriate authorities or what have you, and then an archaeologist comes in. And so there's been a history in, the, in our past of kind of throwing our weight around. And I think that's changing a lot. And I think organizations like FPAN have helped that situation. Right. Help, uh, help bridge those divides and help people understand each other a bit better, hopefully. Yeah. And again, Phillips continues to not endear himself to the reader. He sings his own praises a little bit. Um, he also m talks about some infighting between himself and the other, the local museum director called by Reed Moore. So Phillips, I think, works for the British Museum. Yes. Yeah. And Reed Moore is a local. And uh, Moore, of course, wants to do the excavation and wants to be involved and all that. And, and Phillips has kind of pushed him and Basil out in a way. Um, and then we get, oh yeah, I, I have here in notes, he's so arrogant. <laughs> he's just really hard to like in this. He gets a little, little more sympathetic throughout the book, but right now, oof. There's a lot of egos. Oh my gosh. A lot of egos in this book. Um, and then we get to kind of the sad part where we find out why he asked for Peggy. Yeah, so this, as a woman <laughs> and just breaks my heart for her um, because she mentions when she's talking to him at the very beginning that, you know, she doesn't have a lot of actual field experience and he's still just so excited to have her on the site. And, you know, she's probably thinking, oh, wow, he's read my work. He thinks I'm a good archaeologist. He sees, you know, me as a promising upcoming professional. And you want me to break the Go news, ahead, Tristan? Yes. So, the reason he wants her on the site is because it's a very delicate site. 
and she's tiny and she has little hands and she doesn't weigh a lot. And so she won't be as likely to break the fragile things that are being found at the right. site. And he's not, he isn't intentionally cruel, but he's kind of, it's kind of demeaning the way he puts it in yeah. the book too. My heart broke for her. Right. <laughs> but I still think she proves herself. So, ha. Yeah. So they that's it for that night. They go they go to bed and get up in the morning and start on the new project. And I noticed right away that Phillips is also two-faced cuz he Basil is there and he's he's very nice to Basil's face. And uh, we won't we we try not to harp on this too much, but boy, <laughs> it's really hard. It's really hard. Yeah. Uh so Peggy and Stuart start to set up square units, which is one of the first things we do. And again, talking about how, you know, Phillips is not necessarily wrong to be critical of Basil's methods. This is one of the most basic things that we do in field work. And I kind of get if this hadn't been done at all before, that that's kind of a problem. Um, and we do that so we can map everything in very, very carefully and and know how much soil we're moving in you know in a unit and that kind of thing. And others, including Basil, get the job of moving the back dirt, which is the worst job. But we've all done it, and it's something that every archaeologist gets to experience. Yeah, every <laughs> every site, or not every site, but many sites, try very hard to plan where the back dirt from the units will go, and try to make it in a place that you will not be digging in um however chances are pretty good still that they end up chasing a a wall or a trench or something that takes you into the back dirt so you have to not only remove the dirt that is part of the actual site itself but you have to remove the dirt that you put there right you have to move the dirt so you can move more dirt it's unfortunate yeah (laughs) so um that's kind of the description of this first day Oh, no, it wasn't. Not quite yet. Uh, Peggy mentioned she wished she brought a hat, which, yes. So this was <laughs> funny to me because they were originally on their honeymoon, and she did not have appropriate clothes for an excavation. So throughout the story, there's her kind of cobbling together outfits. I think at one time she borrows some clothes, and it just... It kind of cracks me up because what you would wear on a honeymoon versus what you would wear on an excavation are two different things, even for this time period. Yep. Peggy, it through, through the author, of course, had a very good, I felt, description of what it's like to dig on a site like this. So I'm going to go ahead and read that. When we had finished, I set to again. The crust of earth felt quite solid beneath my feet. Dust rose all around, caking my hands and stiffening my hair. Normally, there is something not simply absorbing about narrowing one's focus to such a small area, but also soothing. Your world has shrunk to a few square inches of earth, and nothing else matters. Nothing else can be allowed to matter. So, yeah, you just get kind of a tunnel vision, kind of into a zone. Um, I've definitely experienced this. Yeah, and I think earlier on in the book, Basil experiences this as well. Um, he's trying, I believe, to beat the weather, or beat yeah. the sun, and, and or beat the dark, I guess, not the sun. Um, hmm. And I think it's something we've all experienced. And it's exciting and a good stressful, I guess, because yeah. you, you want to find something, you don't want to do any damage, but you're so focused on what you're doing. Kind of becomes a sort of zen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, let's see, they have their first find, which is found by Peggy. Uh, I forget what it is. I remember it was something shiny because wasn't this when she was kind of wiping away tears? She was angry, but she was trying not to show that she was angry. And all of a sudden she sees like a glint of something sparkly and shiny. Yeah. Yeah. What was it? It It's on page 152. Okay. So... They do a really good description in the book of talking about, you know, what she found, how she found it, and what she felt like it's from her perspective. And so she's 
wiping away tears, essentially, and she sees something shiny. And her first thought was that she must have dropped something, which I love. <laughs> You're on an archaeological site and you find something shiny and your first thought is, oh, no, I must have dropped, you know, an earring or something. Um, but she reached down, touched it, realized it was, it was hard. And then she picked it up and lying in the palm of her hands was a gold pyramid shaped object. Um, and it had what appeared to be some jewels in it, I think a garnet and lapis lazuli. Um, she was super excited. Yeah. Which everyone was. Yes. Yeah, right. She, yeah. Yeah, and again, just to reiterate what we said before, too, you, you don't find gold in archaeology. That's not what we're looking for. Although in a you know ancient king's burial site, that's a possibility. Um, so, yeah, everyone's excited. Uh, I, I noticed uh, Basil asked her to show where it came out of, and she was, like, invited him to come down, and he said, oh, I'm not allowed to set foot in the excavation, which is... Sad. Yeah. And the whole time while she's excited, you know, she had just been crying. And she, of course, didn't want the men on the site to know that she had just been crying. So she's trying to, like, wipe back tears and everything. Um, And I think it shows this whole scene in the book kind of does a good job of showing what she as a woman working on this site with a bunch of men. She's not only a woman, but she's a newly minted archaeologist, essentially, who was really only brought here as she just found out because of her size so to me this is a turning point for her where it becomes apparent that you know she is an archaeologist she can do this job she can contribute Mm -hmm. so excavation for the day ends and they of course go to the bar which like you do (laughs) and so they're already kind of known locally here and I, a f- quote from Phillips, it hardly seems fair that it should happen to one so experienced. Like, again, what a jerk. <laughs> yeah, I, it is very difficult to like that man. And I also think it's funny that he was mad that they found an object when he wasn't there. Right, right, as if yeah. There's, if they had any control over when or how or who found the first artifact. Right, and I forget why he was gone, but he had something else he had to be doing. So then some of the discussion at the bar is about the site, of course, and they mention a man called Kendrick who had a similar find at a very early date. Uh, And he said, you know, this this find is from this time period, and he was widely ridiculed and dismissed for that. And they're kind of making fun of him still, even though they're working on a site that, would verify that he's right. And the first one to kind of call them out on it and point this out to them is Peggy, which kind of shuts them up. <laughs> which I, thought, I don't think she necessarily what she intended to do, but good for her. <laughs> no, I think she just simply made that connection. And I think, again, it shows how there was a lot of ego involved. Mm-hmm. And she didn't have that. She was new. She was genuinely interested in learning and in discovering and she just simply saw that connection and made the point to the men yep and so that finishes our first day uh i do i don't know when this kind of starts to come up but i think part of the reason um peggy was crying the first time was because of this uh there are some signs that her relationship even though it really just started with seward is maybe not as healthy or something not quite what she wants it to be. I thought this was interesting contrast between the book and the Netflix series because the Netflix series very clearly suggests that Stuart is gay. Yeah, and the book never really does. Like I kind of picked up on it, but I think I had watched the movie before mm-hmm. reading the book, so my judgment was a bit clouded, I guess. And of course, at this time in the UK, it was criminal to be gay. Right. So it was not, this was a big deal. But, you know, essentially she's, the relationship's not quite going the way she wanted it to. And there's some problems there, though it's never clearly defined, which I think is fine, right? 
I didn't think it was clearly defined anyway. No, no, especially not in the book. Right, which I think is perfectly okay. Um, but that's kind of an underwriting theme or tension going on here as well. So the next day starts up, and they start to find a number of artifacts. They start with pedestaling instead of ripping things out of the ground. And again, it's another good practice that we see change under Philip's guidance that um, Basil was doing incorrectly. Um, you might remember they talked in the last episode, they had what they called a butcher tray, which they just pulled out of the ground and it crumbled the bits. And in this one, instead of pulling it out of the ground, what, what you do is you actually dig around it and make a little pedestal for it. And then you can just slide your trowel in the, through it, the dirt underneath it and pop it out all in one go very gently. Very, very good practice for delicate items. Yeah, and they were finding a lot of delicate items at this Amazingly site. Amazingly delicate. Um, they were finding leather. Like yes. Stitched leather, which, you know, being an organic material, it takes specific environmental conditions for something like that to preserve. And when you take it out of that environment, even just temporarily, it starts to degrade really fast. So it takes extra care. You know, you can't just pull it out of the ground. It might crumble in your hand. Well, and then they, they messed that up a bit, too, because they pulled out that stitched leather shoe. And it was kind of a bundle. And so someone suggested putting it in water, mm-hmm. which hydrated and caused it to unfurl. And they could see it was a shoe. But as soon as they took it out of that water, it just turned to mush because at that point there was, it was the degradation, degradation was just out of control. Um, so yeah, that's something we've learned and gotten a little better at, I think, in archaeology. And I will say a lot of what they did as far as storing the artifacts and um, you know, excavating the artifacts is interesting because I don't think they, number one, expected to find this type of site with these types of artifacts. Right. But they were not prepared to even curate the artifacts, it seems. Yeah. Well, this was, you know, in the infancy of archaeology, and I think they were just kind of starting to understand how much these sorts of things can tell you as well. You know, the, before them, or even during this time, a lot of the archaeology was just ripping out pretty things from the ground. The fact that they were even interested in a leather shoe is a pretty marked step forward for the discipline as a whole, I'd say. Fair enough. And yeah, the fact that, like you said, Peggy was making connections to what had been found at other sites that Mm -hmm. had to deal with the actual human beings that occupied these sites and created these sites is pretty phenomenal for that time period because most of it was find cool things, put it in a museum or put it in a private collection. Right. Yeah, I've I've literally seen reports from some excavations years after this, actually, where some of the people on the site got to take artifacts home with them. And like, no, Ouch. That's, that's not good practice. It wasn't good practice at that point either, but that's very faux pas these days. Very. So let's see. Miss Pretty, Mrs. Pretty, brings up the fact that she wants to hold a party where she invites a bunch of people out to come and view the site. And I know we, you and I both have laughed about this already because Phillips is not thrilled. There is an old saying in archaeology, which we are trying to undo, but I've literally heard archaeologists say, I didn't get into archaeology to deal with a living. Yep. Essentially what Miss Pretty was trying to do was like public archaeology, which is what you and I do. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and her reasoning was very good. If if we have a set day where people can come out and see it, then that should free up the rest of the time. People won't be stopping by and causing uh, disruptions. But Phillips is not thrilled with the whole thing because it's a whole day where he doesn't get to work, I think, largely it. Well, and it's that whole ivory tower mentality, I think, where you're right. how can we have these people that do not understand the site come out they obviously aren't worthy almost of this right site. and they might damage it and and everything and yeah he would not make a good public archaeologist so there is more gold found and everyone gets very very excited about this and comes kind of 
to look and see it. And they found a little cache of coins, actually, is what happened here. Yes. And I've seen this on archaeological sites, not with gold, to be clear again, but where we're just starting the excavation and the first person to find a point. Like everyone has to stop and go look at it and, and, and look what's going on. And people get very excited about this stuff uh, when we start to find things or find something different at these sites. They find some fibers. Yeah, it was cool. I mean... It's kind of amazing that they were preserved, yeah. Usually it takes very special circumstances for those to last. The fact that they found it, too, is also a testament to their skills. Yeah, I will say that's true. I Even today, I think threads, like it wasn't even, they didn't even say it was like a piece of fabric. It was literally threads. That would be hard to find by today's standards right. if it wasn't something that you were thinking might be at that site. Right, right. right. If you didn't even know this is a spot where we might find it. You know, it could be easy to miss or damage. Let's see. Stuart finds a belt buckle, a very nice ornamental giant belt buckle, I guess. And I thought this was interesting. I didn't know what to read into this. He wanted Peggy to show it to everybody. Did you have any thoughts on what was going on there, character-wise? Yeah, it was interesting. And I don't know. I think this was kind of meant to be an endearing moment for Stuart. I think he was trying to build her up, maybe. Right, yeah. He yeah. was, you know, why don't you go show it to them? Right, it's just not entirely clear. But I, that's the way I interpreted it. Right. Um, I don't know, obviously, what the author's intentions were, but it just seemed like it was a moment where he realized Peggy was kind of having a rough time and having to deal with all the right. machismo, I guess. You know, this was an opportunity for him to kind of build her up. Right, because whatever problems they may be having, there's no question that there is genuine affection and respect between them. I I did like that a lot. Yeah, and I think he recognizes, too, that Peggy is good at what she is doing. He does, yeah. You know, it's not, he wasn't just saying, oh, do this. You know, you go show them this artifact because she needs help or mm -hmm. anything. It was, I know you're good. It was almost like a confirmation. Right. Yeah. Uh, then they, <laughs> I like this, they pack their artifacts in candy bags provided by Robert. <laughs> Which, if you recall from our first episode, part one, Robert was Miss Pretty's little boy. Right. And then they put them in the seed boxes to eventually take them to the British Museum. And that's when you talked about uh, preservation. Um, that would not be very good practice today. Depending on the site and conditions, you can have different ways of packaging, but coming prepared with packaging is important. And it's always possible you find something you didn't expect and have to improvise, but Hard objects are not unexpected. Well, and, and it seems like all they did was improvise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was no <laughs> planning, which, again, it did kind of come up, and they are in a rush, as we talked about last episode a bit. The World War II is looming, so they know they have to get this done before the war starts or they'll never get it finished. But who shows up to an archaeological site without artifact baggies? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but they made it work, I guess, so I give them credit. Uh, and I like this, too, because Miss Mrs. Pretty uh, insisted that Basil Brown carry the artifacts to the, to the house. And uh, throughout the book, even though, you know, she let Phillips kind of take over, she's been his advocate as far as making sure he gets respect, which he doesn't anyway, but she's been, she does what she can, essentially. It's, it's shown that. So... The next day, Stuart is leaving all of a sudden to take the artifacts to the British Museum. There is some question, and this will come to later on in the, in the book, about who owns these artifacts. Is it the British, the government, or is it Mrs. Pretty? And so that's not something they'll deal with right now, but they're taking to the British Museum for safekeeping just because this is a lot of gold to be keeping in the house, and it could be asking for trouble. Um, literally keeping under Robert's bed, actually. Yeah. So. Well, like, and I like the interaction here in this uh, section, too, because, you know, Reed Moore is trying to claim they belong to the local museum. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, they're, 
you know, the British Museum wants them. And then uh, even though they're going to the British Museum temporarily, it's stated, someone says, you know, be sure that these artifacts belong to Miss Pretty. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's really interesting. And I think there's, I mean, now we have laws and stuff that make it a little bit more clear, but for a site like this at the time, you know, they didn't expect to find something as phenomenal as they did. And I think it just kind of up the ante on who gets to keep it. Right. I think if it was a less interesting site, there wouldn't be such a battle over it who. It was a bunch of nails or yeah. tools or something. Yeah. So, again, them kind of making this up as they go along. Peggy and Robert go and collect moss to cushion the artifacts as I they travel. I love this interaction. Christine. Yeah, this is it really is, nice. It is. So, yeah, they have all these delicate artifacts, and they want something that kind of cushions them. And so they go, and Peggy and the little boy Robert go into the woods to find moss. And I think there's an interaction where they're talking about reading a book. Um, mm -hmm. And I liked this particularly. Peggy is describing to Robert why archaeology is so important, why these artifacts matter so much. I'm just going to read this here. But it's not just the, its value that's important, I went on. What's even more exciting is that it comes from a time when everyone thought that people had become very primitive. That's why they're called the Dark Ages, you see, because people were thought to have slid back into darkness. And so that brings to home how, how important this site is. But it also, I like the, it's not the value that matters. Well, That's something we harp on a lot. So I just had to, I had to look it up, but, you know, I mentioned they started a conversation while they're digging up this moss about a book. It was Treasure Island. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I just thought it was interesting that that is brought up, and then she talks about how it's not just about the treasure that's right. important in archaeology. So I think it was a very uh, clever way to kind of bring that up, and I also like that Treasure Island, I guess, was considered a boy's book, right? right. And I think Robert was like, you know, you like that book? He, it's he a, hadn't read he it. He hadn't read it, but right. she was like telling him that, you know, it, people think it's more of a boy's book, but I've always preferred boy's books, Yeah, which I think just kind of gives you a little bit further, more information on Peggy. Right. And you know, she's a little bit of a tomboy. She's a little bit of a rebel. She doesn't necessarily conform to what you would think a woman's role would be in that time period. And I guess that's why I kind of like her a lot. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I liked this. It's not about archaeology, but it's a good literary bit. Uh, they, Peggy and Robert see a, what they call a barrage balloon come be raised overhead. And from a literary way, it's literally the threat of war is overhanging the excavation, which good, good job. I yeah. like that. And a barrage balloon, I looked this up, it's literally a, a balloon that goes real high and has a steel cable. And the cable, and sometimes when there's multiple, they would actually have cables strung between them. It's designed to be a hazard for planes, particularly bombers. So it is designed that if they're not careful, they could run into that cable. And uh, I guess there are cases where they're, they did thwart Bombs, bombing attacks with this, and there's uh, even some planes that were taken down with these this techniques. But it's just kind of a, a defensive, like, kind of like a tank trap and that kind of thing. But, That's crazy. Just yeah. In this day and age, when we have so much technology available to us, uh, especially when it comes to military defense, the fact that they were essentially linking giant balloons up in the sky <laughs> to thwart off airplanes is just mind-blowing right me. right um can you look up on page 180 phillips accepts an idea from basil brown and i thought that was cool okay so i found it here um so yes uh i'll just read the section sure so so on i'll just give us a little go ahead so uh at this point basil makes a suggestion and phillips accepts it, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. So this is on page 180 for those of you following along. And it says, when this was finished, they were able to take the first complete measurements of the ship. It was just under 90 feet 
from one end to the other, the original ship, however, would have been even longer. The last six feet of the stern end is missing, sheared away. Philip thought that medieval farmers must have been responsible. It was Mr. Brown who suggested the ship might have been deliberately put into the ground at an angle. He believed that the stern protruded above the mound like a great horn, thus ensuring it was clearly visible from the other side of the river. To my surprise, Phillips did not dismiss this theory out of hand, even conceding that it might have had some validity to it. I, again... Phillips does have little occasional redeeming moments like this where he doesn't just dismiss everyone else's idea, even if it contradicts his own. If someone has a good idea, it seems like he does consider it and, and even acknowledge, vocalize if he thinks it's a good one. So I thought, interesting. And I thought it was interesting that this is from Peggy's perspective, and she's like, to my surprise. Right, <laughs> because, because she's... Her- She's fully picked up on this relationship here. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, and she's in a, I wouldn't say the exact same position as Basil, but because she is a professional and she does have the degree, but she's a woman. Right. And so I think Phillips somewhat thinks of her and Basil to be in the same camp in his mind, you know, inferior in some way. Right. So... They continue excavating, and Phillips is in the excavation for a reason I never fully understood because he specifically said he's too heavy to be in there, but he's in there anyway, so whatever. Uh, Phillips and Peggy together, find they find a cut stone, and then they uncover an eight-faced stone scepter. And this is when they start to fully realize maybe this was someone really, really important. Because a scepter is, a, I guess, a pretty significant symbol. And this was a quite a hefty thing, too. Seemed like it's not something you'd want to carry around with you. And I think, I, if I understand, I mean, obviously, I don't know a lot about British royal history. But a scepter is something, even today, that royals, I think, hold when they're actually being coronated. And so it's just interesting to me because... You again, this site kind of changes the course of thinking as far as this time period. And you have someone who's holding a scepter during what people consider the dark ages. You wouldn't expect that. Right. You know, so again, it's just another example of how this site kind of turned things on its head. And such an elaborate, finely made scepter, too, was part of the significance there as well, of course. Let's see, they also find a what they call a mass of purplish metal that when it gets warmed up in the sun, again, we talked about the conditions we find things in, but it splits open and it's full of, of silver bowls, which I think may have been money at the time or a form of money, but I don't know 100%. So, Sherry Party Day starts. Hmm. This is an interesting one for a lot of reasons. So they leveled off the back dirt and built stands for the guests. And oh, sorry, they just let that was just for the guests to stand on, but they also put up a, a bleachers essentially. People could get up there and look. And uh, Peggy recognized that she expected Phil to be very grumpy this day, but he seemed to just kind of ignore anything that m- made him unhappy. So he was actually still pretty cheerful, which I thought was interesting. Uh, this day, they find a big silver plate with marks. Uh, maker's mark essentially on it which is very exciting for any you know we if we're digging and we find a plate with maker's mark on it or a piece of plate with a piece of maker's mark that's an important find because you can usually trace who made that and sometimes very narrowly when it was made so also very significant and nowadays we have google images so a lot of times right. we can just get on in the internet or even get on our phones and find out right then when, where, who, all sorts of information about that artifact in real time. Could not do that during this excavation, though. No. However, they did have someone who just knew. In this case, they knew that this plate came all the way from Constantinople. And for a time where everyone is supposed to have slid backwards, the fact that trade routes extended as far as Constantinople or Istanbul as it is today, that's a big deal. That's, again, another piece of evidence telling them that this is uh, uh, not what they thought was going on in this time period. 
I made a note of this they, because they talked about how the person called, ironically called Grimes, is always the cleanest one. And I thought that was funny too because I've always known there's seems to be like on a big crew, there's always that one archaeologist that somehow doesn't get really dirty. And they're always working, but somehow they just don't get dusty or covered in mud. Somehow they always stay clean. Yes, and I am not that archaeologist. Me neither. No, not at all. I remember once I was excavating at a military base, and they were allowing us to go into the mess hall to eat lunch. And we were excavating a midden, so it's this dirty, dark, greasy dirt. And I didn't realize that I had like a dirt mustache. I'm yeah. sitting there talking with all these people that were in the military, nice, cleanly dressed. And I'm sitting there in dirty clothes with a dirt mustache the whole time eating lunch. Yeah. So nobody on my crew told me that. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Have a conversation between Pretty and Peggy about why there's no body. And that's something that we've, we're not surprised to see necessarily. But there's a couple ideas I thought was interesting. One was that simply preservation wouldn't allow. If you have very acidic soils, the uh, bones, even bones won't last very long. Uh, for example, Pensacola, I know has extremely acidic soils. It's very rare to find bone at all yeah. in that place. But another one I thought was good was that perhaps the person may have, you know, died in a shipwreck or elsewhere. And this was a memorial to that person. They just didn't, maybe they didn't have a body to bury. So that's, Interesting point and a very, I think, very possible. Uh, Phillips tells Peggy not to talk to journalists, which, again, that's a common... There's a, a frequent tension between uh, journalists and archaeologists. I love it, too, because <laughs> it cracked me up. Um, there was a point where Phillips says, if news of this gets out, we'll have all sorts of people swarming around here, journalists and the like dreadful people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so that tension isn't necessarily anyone's fault. I think a lot of that just comes down to different goals and each group is looking for different things and they're kind of at cross purposes with each other sometimes. The journalists are looking for a story that will sell papers and the archaeologists have different goals and that's not necessarily what they're trying to do. And it was a cringe-worthy moment for me in that interaction. Yeah, too. it's really <laughs> unfortunate. Um, so, you know, Phillips is telling Miss Pretty, you know, we don't want to have journalists at this site, and they're dreadful people. And he's telling her, you know, you're going to be asked a bunch of essentially dumb questions, um, and you don't have to tell them anything. Just be clear. And she says, quite clear. And he says, good girl. Oh, yeah. Ugh. I mean... Product of the time, I suppose. Remember, yes. this is 1940s. I know, but... It's, it's still just, hard to stomach these days, though, isn't it? She's the landowner, and she allowed you to come on the site. Besides all of the well, other he was things, he was talking to Peggy there, I thought. It was he? I thought it was Miss Pretty. I don't think he would dare do that, Miss Pretty. Uh, 197. Oh, you're right. Sorry about that. That's all right. That out. Good to get that cleared up, though. But still, it's still cringy. Yes. Just not quite as cringy as yeah. <laughs> doing nope, it to Miss right. Pretty. <laughs> Sorry about that. Go ahead, all right. Um, but yeah, no, it's just ugh. <laughs> still, still ugh. So the the party starts and more is there, along with a couple of people he's trying to schmooze. And this is where we see more of the politics between the local museum and the British Museum, and it's kind of. Kind of cringy as well. No one's allowing anyone else to save face here. You know, it's just maneuvering and, and not nice at all. I just feel like, you know, a lot of archaeologists are introverts by nature. Right. And reading through this whole thing, it I wasn't even there. And it made me so uncomfortable. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> no kidding. So Philip starts the talk and he says... From the start, they won't allow people in the stands because they're concerned about collapse. I don't know the validity of that, but they put up the stands like that day, so it's kind of odd. But they did have some rains, so he might. You could you could work that out. You could yeah, do. Yeah, that was a weird. You could do sets of five people at a time, you know, or something. Well, and to me, reading through it's like they went through all this work to set up those stands and everything. And now they're like, never mind. We're not going to allow people up there. I feel like there's a little bit of control freak stuff going on here where he's trying to 
assert authority and this is my site and that kind of thing. Yeah. However, Moore just tries to ignore this and goes up with some people, which is very bad manners. That's intentionally bad manners. Yeah, and like I said, there's a lot of power plays yeah. in this part, especially in this section of the book, because it's all come into a head. You know, everybody wants these. They know what they have now, right? Essentially, and yeah, I, but I honestly, I kind of can't blame him. I don't know. I feel like if I was there, knowing my personality, I would kind of start doing things like that just to annoy Philip. <laughs> That's fair. I mean, just because he's being. So so bossy and controlling it would frustrate me and he, he like i said he doesn't have any concern for other people's saving face or anything he's he's just doing what he wants i like this quote a lot from mrs pretty's nephew did this lot machine guns and they'd be as bad as chicago gangsters yes. uh, that's fantastic <laughs> which is funny to me because this is a little boy like in england wait no uh, his her nephew the photographer. Oh, her nephew. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. I thought you said Robert. Yeah. Um, and so this is the second time we've seen Mrs. Brown in the book. And so she's there with Mr. Brown for the party. Kind of cool to have her there. And boy, she lays into more about how uh, she sees Brown as being mistreated, which, yeah. I love her and I love the relationship she has right. with Hazel. It just, she is his number one cheerleader. Right. But she makes kind of a stink. And I thought this was amazing because Mrs. Pretty comes over and in the most classy way chastises both Mrs. Brown and Mr. Moore. She compliments Mrs. Brown to throw her off. And then I think it has gone as well as could have been expected. Her eyebrows rose fractionally bar the odd intrusion like oh boy <laughs> what a classy way of saying stop it both of you <laughs> yeah she has perfected the compliment sandwich <laughs> oh my yeah and it wasn't even a, a, a direct you know there wasn't even a direct challenge in there she just kind of said stop it yeah behave yeah very good and so i want to go i want to backtrack for just a second because um you know you talk about the nephew, mm -hmm. Miss Pretty's nephew. And if you Google the site of Sutton Hoo, a lot of photographs will come up. And right. in the book, you would assume those photographs were taken by her nephew. Um, in reality, this was, he didn't exist. Right. Um, in reality, those photos were taken actually by two women who were on holiday um, uh, Mercy Lack and Barbara Wagstaff, they were teachers and they were on holiday. Um, and the author just kind of combined them into two characters or into one character. And I think it's interesting that the character happens to be a male when the photographs were actually taken by women. And I wonder if the author did that to kind of strengthen the um, kind of issues Peggy was having uh, on site, mm. you know, because in this book, it's only Peggy and Miss Pretty who are the two women out there. Right. And in reality, there were at least four women, right? Right. Well, uh, that makes sense. If there was, I, I was thinking if there was like Rory out there dedicated to taking photographs, there aren't that many photographs. Right. So this would make more sense that this was done by just a few people, a couple people while they were there. On that holiday, just yeah. doing their thing. Right. And I also think it's interesting because I also wonder if the author did that because Phillips in the book most obviously does not want anybody on the site who does not need to be on the site. Mm -hmm. When in reality, it seems like there were visitors kind of coming and going. Right. You yes, know? As you would have on a right. big local site, a big find. People are going to want to see this. Yeah. So I, there's a lot of... Uh, the author is taking some license with the characters mm -hmm. and the, the actual history, I think, to kind of strengthen the roles in the book. Which you're allowed to do in historical yeah. fiction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Peggy and Rory go looking for nightingale, nightingales. Uh, so this is kind of hinting at some potential budding romance between the two of them. I liked, and maybe you can look this up for me, Barbara, on 215, Rory has a 
you, they use photography as an analogy for archaeology, which I thought was really good, too. Okay. Um, do you want me to read? I suppose. I suppose it seems a way of trying to fix moments as they went past, to try to capture them and give them some physical existence, stop them from being lost forever. Not that it necessarily works like that. And he goes on to say, for instance, do you know why there aren't any people in photographs of Victorian London? Take a look sometime. In early pictures, the streets are completely deserted. Obviously, they weren't deserted. It was just that the plates needed to be exposed for such a long time that people, moving people, didn't register at all. Occasionally, you see a misty outline, but nothing more. It's a strange thought, isn't it? All these ghostly, transparent people making no lasting impression. And then she, he goes on, or, okay, and then goes on. She, I think uh, this is uh, Peggy talking, and she says, it makes perfect sense. That's why I wanted to study archaeology. So much of life just slips by, and with so little to show for it, I suppose I wanted to make sense of what does endure. Yeah. Telling the untold story. That's what we always talk about is and, the purpose of archaeology. Yeah, and I, I remember we, Kristen and I were at an event this weekend, and we were talk, I was talking to a little girl, and I was telling her yeah. – um, one thing I really appreciate about archaeology is its ability to tell the story of people who are not written about in our history books and, you know, people that didn't sign important documents and things. And it was so funny because this girl was maybe eight years old. She looked me dead in the eyes and she just said, oh, all the white men. And I was like, oh, OK, she gets it. <laughs> yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, that's fantastic interaction yeah it was definitely memorable yeah uh so they're coming back from their nightingale listening watching and there's policemen guarding the site which is interesting uh also very smart considering you just had a party there and certainly it's going to be in the newspapers and things and this is something i haven't had an issue with this but i know people who have had like they've done an excavation and then went away for a weekend and came back and someone had gone and destroyed big chunks of the site. Yeah, I guess I'm lucky I've never experienced Same. that. Yeah, because that's heartbreaking. All the work you do and trying to be careful and someone just destroys it. Yeah, mostly for me, it's been weather. Right. <laughs> You'll come yeah. back and there's a rainstorm and you have to bail out your excavation <laughs> unit. Oh, bailing. And so now journalists have found out about the site. So apparently now there's such a ruckus that they are just going to shut down the site for a few days rather than trying to deal with all the people, which you don't have to do that, right? Like, we've we've dealt with that on sites, and all you have to do is have some people to kind of run interference and yeah. stop people and ideally guide them, you know, have a set meeting point, and we'll guide you around at certain times or something like that rather than just shutting down. But, you know, this way... Peggy and Stuart both got to have a little mini honeymoon. And uh, Phillips kind of sent them on the way. And I liked the little piece of archaeologist humor here. No time like the present, is there? Not strictly speaking in archaeological terms, of course, but there's something to be said for it just the same. Like, yeah, yeah, we're that lame. Yep, nope. <laughs> I, I had a chuckle at that. Yeah. I'm ashamed to admit yep, it. Yep, <laughs> that's our kind of humor. So the next chapter, we go back to Edith Pretty's perspective, and some time has passed. So the excavation has finished. There's still building war and even drought tensions now. And we are seeing the inquest to decide who owns the artifact. We talked about that earlier, is some question on whether uh, Mrs. Pretty or the, the British Museum owns the artifacts. Uh, this is a, a legal question, so Pretty, Brown, and Phillips all testify. I didn't pick up too much to mention in that, except I thought I, I liked that Phillips acknowledges Brown's expertise in the local soils. Well, and I also think it's important to point out that the inquest is not really taking place in a courtroom like you would expect, is it? It's in like a... Mm, I don't recall where it was. It was... I think in like the village hall. Yeah. And it was this tiny building that really wasn't set up for a case like this. And the number of people that were attending, I remember they mentioning that, you know, it was 
really, really hot yeah. and stagnant. There's only a men's bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> it was like not, you know, because in your mind you would think, oh, they would be in a courthouse right. and it would be very formal, but it seems to be just kind of haphazard. Yeah, I forget if they say why, but I got a sense it was like the best building in this small community that was available. Yeah. And it just was too too small for a subject of this interest, essentially. So let's see. They all testify. Oh, this is where we find out that Phillips has, he believes he's identified who the burial belonged to. He thinks it is King Redwall, who died uh, 625 CE. And I I thought this question from the person asking the question was interesting because he asked, was he Christian? And like, I don't know how that is relevant. But interestingly... Uh, Phillips mentioned that there are both Christian and pagan symbols in the burial, which I think leads to some very fascinating questions that aren't addressed here, but I think that's that's an interesting question. Why are there both? Well, something I found interesting besides that whole religious component is he, he because if the burial was indeed a king, then the question was, you know, if the owner of the treasure had been intending to come back and if so then this would rightfully belong to the crown right. thus the british museum right i just thought that was a really I interesting and strange argument i don't understand that reasoning at all no <laughs> it, it seems really like far-fetched and i'm sure it's true a grasp it. it it could be one of those laws that's got a weird convoluted history about how it came to be so i don't know what the what the situation is now I get an impression from what I've seen that there are more clear-cut rules, guidelines, right. and that kind of well, thing. Well, and he said, like, if the intention had been for the object to accompany the owner on his journey from this world to the next, then they would belong to whoever owned the land. Which is also strange. Yeah, and I'm like, but the whole time this had been seen as a possible burial so it right. just seemed obvious to me that in that instance then they belong to Miss Pretty right which ultimately they decide it does right. and nobody's surprised by it because of that I guess that guideline so that works out um, but she hasn't said what she plans to do with it yet and uh, <laughs> I thought this was funny more and Phillips are still jockeying to get the artifacts in their museum uh, this is at, at her house later on. And then uh, Peggy kind of steps away, and then Mrs. Pretty and Peggy have kind of a nice moment together. I'm not necessarily going to elaborate on that, but character-wise and story-wise, it was I thought it was very nice to see them interacting with each other that way. And that ends the chapter. So next we go to another short chapter by... Uh, this one is by Basil Brown's Perspective. And he is experiencing post-project funk, which, yeah. Especially a project of this type. This is I your mean, life project. This is the big one yeah, you get for your life. Yeah, this is the pinnacle yeah. of your career right, right here. You know that already, yeah. And he's so it's all done, and he's kind of in a funk, which is fair. Uh, there's indication that Mrs. Pretty is getting more ill. Again, this is never really clarified too much in the book, but it's just kind of alluded to throughout. There's a a nice bit where Phillips sends Brown a nice letter and his favorite tobacco, which that, again, that's a bit of a redeeming moment for Phillips because he doesn't need anything from Basil anymore, right? Yeah. But he he went out of his way to do this thing for him and show his appreciation. Like, I can't, I'm not sure quite how to read that. If he changed his mind on Basil at all or or what, but maybe he's just hedging his bets that he might need to work with him again someday. That's See, that's kind of what I wondered, because looking at it from, you know, a modern perspective, archaeology is a pretty small community, right? And if you burn bridges, your little small community keeps getting smaller and smaller. And with a lot of archaeologists, we move jobs a lot compared right. to a lot of people in other careers. So... I, I kind of wondered if it was him maybe recognizing that or being more calculating than and also like I will you know Miss Pretty ended up with the artifact 
and Basil was more endearing mm. to Miss Pretty. So I just wonder if this was kind of like a... It's true. He might have been hoping Basil would influence yeah. Pretty on his behalf. Yeah. Because she hasn't decided what's going to happen to them yet at this right. point. Right. Uh, so he, basically she, the, this project is done, but she's keeping him on the payroll for a while. Not really clear why, except to give him a job and that kind of thing. Uh, so he does some work to protect the site from weather and bombing. He covers it with some branches and things. And he doesn't actually backfill it though. I think that's important. And so at this point they, it's announced, oh, they're digging a, a bomb shelter for the family. And Britain enters World War II. And about this time, Basil heads home, uh, or soon after that anyway. And uh, Mrs. Pretty says she's sending the collection to the British Museum, which we know is what happened. Uh, she also said that she expects, she told Phillips that she expected him to give Basil proper recognition. Right. Yeah. So. And about that. <laughs> it didn't happen quite as Miss Purdy had intended. Let's just say that. Yeah. Um, it wasn't up until recently that the British Museum actually gave him proper credit. Yeah, that's too bad. But I will say, apparently, the the covering of the ship that he did with the branches and things actually preserved it quite well. I think they went back in and excavated, and it was better preserved than they had expected. Yeah. So, Would have been better than nothing, at least. Yeah, and I know it was used. That area was used for military training and stuff too, so it had a little bit of damage from right. that. Right, we find that out in the next chapter, which we're moving to now. Unless you had any more on that one, nope. okay? So next, we jump forward twenty six years, and this is from Robert Pretty's, Mrs. Pretty's son, and his perspective. So we find out that Mrs. Pretty passed away in nineteen forty two. Um, and the property had been sold, but Robert still had rights to excavate, which is interesting. I don't know I how that happened. I thought that was fascinating. I do wonder how that ha- And I know, obviously, Britain probably has very different rules and laws than we do. But having the right to excavate. Is- Someone else's property. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. That would not happen here. <laughs> but he gets a. he hasn't been back, but the British Museum uh, contacts him and wants to reopen the excavation, and then study all of the mounds. And he, uh, of course, says, yes, yes, go ahead. And he comes out to visit later in the excavation and has found that they built a structure over the ship, which is interesting. That's quite a commitment to preservation of the site. And the site was definitely, like Barbara mentioned, was worse for the war, uh, used for the training, and actually pretty badly damaged, I guess. Partly because there were, I guess, there were literally tanks running over it and stuff. Some of it. Um, I guess it was. It was also so bad they decided to dig through the ship to see what was underneath. And before they did that, though, they did a plaster cast of the whole site. Holy cow! I don't even know how you go about doing that. I would love to watch like a video or yeah. something, or read a paper on the process of. You would have to build. Um, sections with a wall i imagine and do it in big sections you would have to i don't know how else you could that would take forever I, yeah it's just when i was reading this i had to actually go back and reread this <laughs> like say what yeah <laughs> i couldn't believe it and nowadays of course we wouldn't even need to do that we've got 3d scanning and other other ways we can preserve it digitally right without that and without having to find a place to store it too well, and that's another thing I was thinking, like, where, okay, so you have a plaster cast of it, now what? <laughs> yeah, you got to keep it forever now. <laughs> so it turns out they, they did find a body, actually at a good distance from the ship, but there was no organic material left. So I, I imagine it's kind of like the preservation of the ship itself, where they there's no wood left, but there's... They can see the imprint, and they yeah. can see the inorganic material and how it's been affected by the wood. Yeah, he, they refer to it as outline of the body had survived. Yeah. So I would imagine possibly, you know, what we would consider a picture. Right. You know, there was a stain in the dirt, essentially. We get a up. We get an update on what happened to everybody, which I'm not going to go through, but I was happy to see that at this point, at least, Basil Brown was still 
alive because I like Basil. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, and they talk about like Rory Lomax, the the nephew died right. in nineteen forty seven. Um I think in the war, right? I think so. Oh no, a motorcycle accident. Oh, that's right, that's right. right. Yeah. But I think he, he did go to war, which so especially in the movie, I feel like they emphasize more the the romantic relationship between him right. and Peggy than they do in the book. So, much more. Yeah. Much more. And um, it's it's co- it's kind of only it's not even really alluded it, to. It could just be a though. very nice friendship for all we know. Yeah. Right? So it's not yeah. even really it's never taken to that point. But in the movie, it is like there's no it's, denying the fact that there was a romance. There's a lot less subtlety in the yeah. Show. But remember, he's a fictional character. Right. So he either never way, existed. That never happened. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> And then the last note I have for this book is uh, I like they found a very precious artifact. I love this so much. What did they find? They found Robert's roller skate, you guys. Yeah, and they, earlier oh. earlier in the book, he was upset because he'd lost a roller skate. And, and, and they uh, found it. Yep. And I have goosebumps to saw. I love that. Yeah, and I love how that's, that's how they... Ended. And he got he got to keep that one. They he has it sitting on his desk, you he know. Has it sitting on his desk. Yeah. I just love that because good touch. I think it, and looking at it from an archaeologist perspective too. When you're ex, I just I, this kind of made me think like when you're excavating a site, you kind of become part of that site's history, and that's right. just a really cool thought as an archaeologist. Like every site that I've excavated or every site I've worked on. I become part of that. And I know that's like really sentimental and cheesy and stuff like that. And I, if you're not an archaeologist, you're like, okay, weirdo. But <laughs> I I just think it's really neat because you become part of that site history. Like, you know, I'll, and Tristan, you probably do the same thing. Like you're driving around an area where you excavated or you've done a survey and you're like, oh, I dug there. Oh, there's a site there. Oh, da, da. And, you know, and we think of it as part of our history or the history of our career. Mm-hmm. But to think that, you're a part of that site too. I was just like, oh, that's kind of cool. Well, there and, literally I mean, have been excavations where they go back and excavate the excavation. And if they're old enough, they study the old methods and what was done because it's not always good record keeping, you know? Or, right. And I just, I thought it was a cool little analogy to that and it made me think, like, oh, wow, as an archaeologist, it kind of works both ways. Yeah. I thought that was neat. Okay. And that is the finish to the book, The Dig by John Preston. What were your thoughts on this one, Barbara? So I really liked this book for a variety of reasons. Number one, amazing site, right? Really cool. Um, makes me want to go and see the site next time on I'm on that side of the pond, I guess. Um, I also like how it it focused on the site and it focused on not just the artifacts, but the story the artifacts told and the people like I I think it was just really interesting and insightful to you know get a get each individual person's kind of perspective the way they had the book divided into chapters from different people's perspective was really interesting to me and I mean I'll have to say Peggy was my favorite character Hmm. obviously she's pretty good character yeah but what did you think of it I I really liked it as well uh, like you said, I liked its kind of focus on archaeology and the methods at the time. I thought that was interesting, especially with our background. Um, I I also really liked it from just a storytelling perspective. I I liked how there is a lot of things that aren't explicitly said, but they're alluded to in such a way that you kind of figure out what's going on as the story progresses, like uh, Mrs. Pretty's illness, uh, the looming war, uh, there are a few other cases like that where it's not really laid out clearly, but it doesn't need to be. And it's it's written in such a way that it I liked it how it was handled. And and the characterization and the characters themselves are are fun and reading this in a historical fiction way does make the story a lot more digestible. So here's the question for you. Obviously not every book we read has a movie. Right. <laughs> Did you like the movie or the book better? Book. Same with me. I like the portrayal of Peggy specifically mm-hmm. in the book better because like we said earlier in the movie, it's there's no doubt that there's a romance between her and Peggy or 
Miss Purdy's nephew. And I don't like the way the movie. I don't like it the way it portrayed Stuart as yeah, well. Like yeah, in, in I this. Think it just kind of, it, it pulls more on stereotypes and stuff yeah. in the movie than I think it does in the book. There's a lot more subtlety and. Um, and in this, there's like there's clearly uh, respect and f- at least affection between them. Yes, you know, so you can see how they ended up together. Right. Even yeah. if it's not going well. So I would suggest if you haven't already watched the movie to read the book first. Um, I think I watched the movie and then read read the book, and I wish I would have done it the other way around. Which I mean, in most instances, I feel like that's good advice when there's a movie made after a book, but. It's time to move on to a new book, Kristen. Yes, it is. What are we doing this time, Barbara? I'm excited about this. We are doing a book called Captain Kidd's Lost Ship. It's the wreck of the Cata Merchant, and it's written by Frederick Hanselman. And you guys, it's all about pirates, which, hello, pirates are cool. Yep. But this one specifically is about um, the events involving Captain Kidd's capture of the Cata Merchant. And this eventually led to his execution for being a pirate. Um, The ship's location remained a mystery for over 300 years, apparently. But then in 2010, a team of underwater archaeologists found the site of the Cato Merchant. And it was off the coast of the Dominican Republic. And what I really am excited about, because, you know, there's so much information about what pirate life would be. And there's all these documentaries and stuff. And... A lot of them uh, just seem kind of blown out of proportion and more based on, you know, the stereotypes or our ideas of this kind of, I wouldn't say romantic vision of a pirate, but this like adventure and, Mm -hmm. you know, it was a tough life apparently. (laughs) And it was kind of. We have talked like a pirate day. So I think we have pretty romantic idea of what piracy was. And like I said, he was executed. Right. Um, Not a great end. But. This book uh, goes over, it reveals the insights into life of what it would have actually been like Mm -hmm. to be a pirate and what it was like aboard the ship. And it's all based on archaeological evidence and historical documents and stuff. So it'll just be really cool to get a more accurate account of what it would have been like. Sure. And so neither of us have read this book yet, but it comes recommended to us from someone we, we both work with. And it's this one isn't historical fiction, but I think there will be a good talk about kind of what they're doing, what they're experiencing as they're doing excavation. So I think it should be good and accessible. As far as reading goes, I do want to acknowledge that if you want to buy the book, there's only a hard copy cover, hardcover copy, and it is not cheap. So uh, you can, of course, listen along with us as we talk about it, or You can do what we're going to do, and we've actually found it at a library. So if you can manage that, you can read along with us. Um, So just kind of so you can be aware of that. And so uh, you want to read. I'm looking at the table of contents right now, Barbara, and it looks like there's about not quite 200 pages. So if we do um, the first three up to to the first three chapters, so that would be about 90 four pages. That sound okay? That sounds good to me. I'm excited. All right. I'm looking forward to this one and we'll see you all next time. Enjoy your reading, guys. <laughs>